Yeah, yeah. Okay, so good morning, everybody. So I'm a, um, my name is Kalepa Bai Bai, and I am, a, for the past 45 years, I have, uh, I've been involved in the, uh, the Voyaging Canoe Revival in Hawaii and across the Pacific. I started out when I was uh, 19 years old on the island of Maui, and I have uh, um, started as a crew member and eventually progressed to becoming a, 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 a navigator uh, uh, initiated in the, in the hierarchy of uh, traditional non-instrument navigators in, in Micronesia uh, in, the, in the post ceremony. And so I'm just gonna tell a story um, and you guys feel free to interrupt me anytime if you got any questions. But uh, the story I'm gonna tell is called Helani Koluna, A Sky Above. Uh, and it, in losing the sight of land, you discover the stars. Okay, next, uh, next slide. All right, so the, the story I'm gonna share is about the, about the last human migration to settle the planet Earth. And that last human migration to settle planet Earth took place on the, on the world's largest geographic feature, the world's ocean. 70% uh, of the Earth's surface is made up of water. And so the, the challenge of, 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 of figuring out how you're going to go and explore the ocean is, what, is, is why, in terms of human migration, the oceans was the last place to be settled. Uh, in 2014, I had the rare privilege to sail Hokulea around the world. I participated in most of the most of the legs, and up until then, up until 2014, my whole perspective was was that our story was an oceanic story. But as we started to sail around the world, I began to realize that that human migration is is a is a global story, and so that changed my perspective. And so we're going to share this global story. And we're going to go back to the very infancy, next slide, of uh, where humans emerged on this planet and what drove them uh, towards the edges of the continent and the world's oceans. Next slide. So our human population, right, Homo sapiens, yeah, we are the, we are the last of the hominid species to have survived. We are the only hominid species to have survived. But we have been on this planet for only 200,000 years. In, in geologic time, that's, that's if, if January 1st was the, was the, was the, was the start of the, the universe, then in geologic time, uh, December 31st, like the last minute of the day is when humans appear on, on this planet. But 200,000 years ago, we, we emerge on this on this planet, Homo sapiens, in what's called a, a far triangle, which is right on the coast of the Red Sea, up within 190,000 years is, and and 200,000 years we appear here, right? But 10,000 years into our history as Homo sapiens, the Earth goes into this 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 very large ice age, and it increases the uh, uh, the expanse of the Sahara Desert exponentially and the cold weather drives humans all the way down to the to the tip of of South Africa next next slide right here on the on the tip of South Africa we humans uh, live and for 80,000 years we go through all the needed uh, intellectual uh, and and uh, uh, changes that describe or provide humans with, with its with its with what is new, new, known as human traits. Next slide. We end up walking, right? So the first thing that about about Homo sapiens that 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 make us different from every other hominid species is is that we are bipedalists. We our closest relative on on the on our hominid family tree. Are chimpanzees. There's only a 10% deflection in, in uh, hu uh, human and chimpanzees uh, DNA that provide us, provide us humans as being uh, being different, right? So so we're bipedalists. We, we have uh, and 
we have the largest craniums of any hominid species on the planet, right? Our, our average uh, cranial cavities are 1300 cc's, much larger than, than a chimpanzee's. But we walk all the way to the South African tip. And here, we're probably a population of no more than 400, right? From that 400, we spring for several billion uh, Homo sapiens that now inhabit the earth. Next slide. And so we inhabit the very margins of the South African uh, continent, living out in the open. And when in inclement weather, we hide in the, these caves. Next slide. But what's, what is, what provides us with the ability to increase our brain capacity is that we start to explore and learn how to harvest the rich marine resources of the South African continent. Things like shellfish, uh, seaweed, and, uh, and uh, uh, carcasses of dead whales. And in the, the, those kinds of nutrients, there is this uh, enzyme omega-3. And omega-3 is like brain fertilizer. So we're not only develop, developing the human traits, right? But we're also feeding our brain this, this high nutrient-rich uh, uh, diet, which helps to spur on brain development. But what's most amazing, next slide, is that we humans become aquatic. We learn how to swim, and we learn how to explore the world's oceans, okay? But after about 80,000 years, and again, we're developing all the human traits that, uh, that make us distinctly uh, uh, unique as a, as a, as a, as a population, um, like language, right? We develop the, the ability to, to speak and articulate our ideas, like uh, ch chimpanzees have a, have a language, just like humans, right? They have, a, they have a sound they make to identify that there's a lion close by. So when they make this sound, they'll all stop and, and rise up on, on their four hindquarters and they'll, they'll look around uh, for, for what is supposed to be a, a lion. The difference between what a chimpanzee can communicate and a human, a human can say, well, lion, but the lion's next to the tree, next to the bend in the, the river behind these bushes. And so that's our ability in terms of language proficiency to articulate a lot better. Okay. Um, okay, next slide. After about 80,000 years, the earth warms and we re-migrate uh, re up north to Northern Africa cross over the Red Sea, and then we spread all over, all over Asia and Europe. Europe has already been settled by a previous hominid species called Neanderthals, right? Asia was already settled by Homo erectus. In fact, down here in Southeast Asia, there is a, 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 a very diminutive people. Uh, they resemble pygmies. They are called Homo florensis. They live in the Flores Islands, but by about 40,000 years ago, we have come to outlive every other hominin species on the planet. We become the, the, the last human uh, population on the planet. And we walk, right? we are pedestrian, right, bipedalists. And we walk to every corner of the Asian continent, all the way down here in Southeast Asia, across these land bridges into the Solomon Islands. We also walk across Siberia, into North America and South America. So the planet was first settled by, uh, by pedestrian people, pedestrian humans. We got, to, we got to every place on the earth by walking. Next slide. Okay. To cross from Southeast Asia into Australia, right, at the, at the last ice age at about 50,000 years ago, these passes right here are very, very narrow. Now, why this uh, waterway is only about 40 miles wide? It's about the distance between of the other Molokai Channel canoe race. Uh, you, you don't need very sophisticated watercraft. You can just simply tie logs together and float that distance. You don't need to navigate because you can see where you uh, land ahead. And so about 40,000 years ago, we actually float our way to Australia. And then we settle Australia and, uh, and Tasmania. 
But by about 10,000 years ago, the earth warms. And when the earth warms, uh, the warming of the earth floods this, these, these narrow passages. And now these narrow passages are, are full of water. And the people that actually walked into Australia, they're landlocked. They don't have any way to escape because they don't have the sophisticated sea craft needed to explore, ex explore the, um, the world's oceans. And so we walk into Australia when the, when the uh, seas are a lot lower, the earth warms, right? Seas become higher and now we're trapped. Okay, next slide. Then about 10,000 years ago, in response to the rising uh, sea levels, people living in, in South China begin to explore and they settle island Taiwan. Island Taiwan, that little island off of China, is the oceanic homeland for all Pacific Islanders. So if you're a Pacific Islander, uh, whether you live in Micronesia or Melanesia or Polynesia, right, Tahiti, Samoa, Tonga, or the Cook Islands, you genetically are related back here to islanders on the island of Taiwan. Next slide. And the, the way they got there was by about 5,000 years ago, they had developed a seafaring technology that allowed them to explore the world's oceans, right? Basically sailing canoes and, uh, and a very basic system of navigation. Okay, next slide. We know exactly the exact trail that they took into the Pacific Ocean because of linguistics, right? We all speak a common hereditary language called Austronesian. Uh, genetically, because of DNA, we all share the same genetic makeup. And because of archeology, span right? Uh, the main archeological uh, artifact that identify the route that people took into the Pacific is this pottery called Lapita. Lapita is this very dentate stamp pottery, very distinctive and with clay pots, right? Uh, what happens if you drop it, right? It breaks and it leaves shards, right? And because they can, these shards still exist today, they're able to trace the pathway that people took into the uh, Pacific Ocean. Okay, next slide. Also, other artifacts. This is a stone adze, uh, a very small diminutive stone adze. And in about 20 years ago, uh, some scientists wanted to study the distribution of stone adzes. And they, they sought out a collection of 17 stone edges that came from the coral atolls of the Tuamotu Archipelago. Next slide. The Tuamotu Archipelago are a group of coral atolls, 70 coral atolls that are about 250 miles uh, northeast of Tiri. And the reason why they're gonna study st uh, stone edges uh, from these coral atolls is, is stone edges are made out of basalt, of volcanic rock. These islands are down here are made out of coral. And so the only way the stone edges could have got there was they had to be imported into the, uh, into the, uh, uh, into the islands. And they're gonna go study this one particular stone edge from this island here called Napuka. Next slide, all right. So Napuka is to the Northeast and they're gonna apply this technique of plasma mass spectrometry. And what it does is it takes a sliver of the stone, melt it down into its plasmatic state. And once it's in, in its, plasmatic state, you can take the chemical and mineralogical uh, signature of that, uh, of that stone, and you can compare it, compare it with other lava flows, and you can identify exactly what lava flow it came from. Next slide. And what they found with that stone at 7727 was that it ends up here in Napuka, but it, but it comes from a, it comes from a quarry here on the island of Kaholavi. Next slide, yeah. On this place on the southwest end of Kaholavi called Keala Ikahiki, right? So somebody transported its stone uh, 2,400 nautical miles to Tahiti. Uh, and the name of this point is really uh, significant, right? Keala Ikahiki. It means the pathway to ancestral lands or the pathway back to Tahiti, right? And that stone came from an ad quarry located in this area. 
that's definitive, undisputed science, right? That that clearly establishes that people a long time ago had to have transported that stone between these archipelagos. Okay, next slide. So, archaeology, linguistics, uh, uh, DNA. Uh, so here's the sequence of how people traveled in the uh, Pacific about. Uh, 3,000 or 4,000 years ago, uh, we arrived in Taiwan. About uh, 20, uh, 2,300 years ago, we arrived here in Fiji, Tonga, and Samoa. And then maybe about 1,000 years ago, we get to Hawaii. Hawaii in, in the north. We get to Easter Island about 900 years ago. And the, finally, the last place that was settled uh, is here, New Zealand. And New Zealand's only been settled by Pacific people for about 800 years. Next slide. But the range that the people actually traveled is about 2,300 kilometers. We get as far as, as uh, South America. We know we got to South America because of two things that they transported out of South America. The sweet potato, the, the uala, the sweet potato that we eat today at, at all our luau's, is a South American cultigen, right? Right, kubura, right? Uala, yeah. It's a South American cultigen, and uh, um, and there's a bottle gourd that they transported out of South America, right? So our the extent of the the our ability to to explore goes as far as the longitude of Denver, Colorado, and extends all the way off the coast of Africa. This is Madagascar. It's only a few hundred miles to the African coast. Madagascar was never settled by uh, by Africans first. first of all. It was settled by people coming out of here, Southeast Asia, and then sailing west towards the coast of Africa. Next. And they did that by constructing this incredible craft for exploring the world's oceans and creating a highly sophisticated system uh, called wayfinding to help navigate and steer their canoes across to distant horizons. Next slide. Yeah. In the 1970s, right, the Polynesian Voyaging Society was formed and there, there, uh, 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 they were hoping to prove that Polynesia was settled on purposeful trip, trips of, of, of intentional migrations. And so they built Hokulea. Hokulea is a design accurate replica of a Polynesian voyaging canoe, right? Uh, it is not construction accurate. It is not made out of uh, marine plywood or, or fiberglass, okay? Next slide. And then they, they recruited an individual from the Caroline Islands in Micronesia, name was Mao Piaila. They recruited him to help navigate the canoe Hokulea uh, to Tahiti from Hawaii, again, so it, this is a research pr project. This is uh, an experiment in archaeology. They, they rebuilt, well, they, they built this, uh, uh, this seafaring craft, much like ancient Polynesia did. They're going to test it by navigating this canoe without instruments. They re recruited a non-instrument navigator by the name of Maupi Island. Next slide. Next slide. OK. And in May of uh, 1976, uh, go back one. May of uh, 1976, they navigate Hokulea. It took them the whole month of May to arrive in Tahiti. And so uh, in terms of the experiment, the experiment was 100% successful, right? They're able to establish that people could have possibly migrated between Hawaii and Tahiti, okay? Next slide. But in terms of the social experiment, the ability of crew members to live together, uh, they they fell short. Uh, Mao, uh, and, and quite frankly, it was such a stressful trip, right? After about being out on the ocean for almost five weeks, uh, things on the canoe began to break down and, 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 and there was a physical confrontation Ma was so disappointed in the behavior of the crew. When he got to Tahiti, he wrote this scathing letter and, and basically abandoned the project. And basically he said, I'm going to leave the project now. I'm going back to Micronesia, my home, 
my homeland. Uh, none of you need to come and look for me because you'll never find me in my islands. And so he departed. Next slide. So they're stuck in Tahiti without a navigator, right? So they had to send down somebody from Hawaii who could use a sextant and a compass to help navigate the canoe home. But on board that trip is a young Hawaiian. It's a very, very bright uh, uh, a student by the name of Nainoa Thompson. And Nainoa Thompson fills up notebooks with all kinds of uh, information that he's observing as he's sailing back uh, to Hawaii. He's observing the night sky and the altitudes of stars and he's filling up his notebooks. When he gets back to Hawaii, he proposes to go back to the university, uh, uh, direct his research uh, in liberal studies, and he proposes to re-engineer the art of non-instrument non navigation. And that's what he does. So he's going to build a, a system of non-instrument navigation based upon science, math, astronomy, uh, oceanography. Next slide. And so he does that in 19... 76 and 77 in 1978 they decide right the polynesian voyaging society decide to sell the canoe back to tahiti and so they recruit a number of uh, uh very uh esteemed watermen of which one was eddie aikau eddie aikau in, back in 1978 was uh was the premier big wave rider on the, on the north shore uh he was one of only two lifeguards on the north shore next slide Eddie Aikau lived in a uh, lived in a cemetery up in Papakolea in uh, Hawaiian homes in uh, uh, on the slopes of Punchbowl. He lived in a sem in a in an Oriental cemetery in a house that was adjacent to his parents' house. His name was Edward Ryan Makua Hanai Aikau, and Makua Hanai in uh, Hawaiian means to be to care for parents, and so that's why he was so attached to his parents. His father. Uh, and, and you know, because entertainment, you had to create your own entertainment. Uh, the Aikau family had a passion and a love for the ocean and, and, and surfing. And the family would always go to the beach on weekends together. Uh, Pop Saikau, Eddie's dad, uh, bought this old uh, uh, old uh, telephone repair truck, the kind of with the two boxes on the side, and he uh, refurbished it and turned it into the, the, the family van. And, and the father eventually helped set up a number of the uh, surf meets on the North Shore. But Eddie became uh, this ambitious and very uh, aggressive uh, uh, surfer. But the family was always close. Every Sunday, no matter how big the surf was, they would go to church together before they would go out to the, to the beach. Uh, they did everything together. In fact, Eddie, next slide, as a lifeguard would... would, would uh, uh, would rescue like 360 people over over 300 and about 370 people a year so he was pulling out people every single day of the year in fact the Haleiwa uh, fire department would have, would say that whenever they'd get a report on the north shore for uh for a rescue whenever they got to the beach eddie was already out on the water pulling them in uh, so in march of 16th of 1978 hokulea departed in, in pretty extreme weather uh, for their trip to Tahiti. Next slide. And after being out on the ocean for only four hours, the canoe capsizes. And when the canoe, the canoe capsizes, and they spend from about 11 o'clock, 11.30 at night, through, through the entire following night on this flipped over canoe, hugging to the halls, uh, just clinging on for dear life. In, in, in the morning, uh, uh, when things are getting kind of desperate and they, they, they're being blown further and further away from the islands, Eddie Aikau asked the captain, volunteers, to go and paddle on his surfboard to go and rescue rescue the crew. Um, and so he takes off to go and seek help. That night, that night around 8.30, the last uh, flight that flies between uh, Kona and Honolulu uh, is, 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 is flying uh, somewhere off of Lanai when the pilot looks off to his, his uh, wing and he sees the flare from the, from, the, uh, from the canoe. He circles over the canoe, the distressed canoe, Hokulea, in, in the water, uh, wags his wings, 
and so they know the crew know that they've been spotted and uh and sends a coast guard out to uh to uh, rescue the crew and so the the crew is rescued that night around 11 30 after being in the water uh 24 hours uh but but eddie was was lost in fact we spent several days looking for eddie uh and we just could not find him eventually uh his father pop Cow, after about five days and in the very end of of, of our search attempts a lot of people were, were getting hurt they're falling off of cliffs and breaking arms and breaking legs his father uh comes to the conclusion he says just let eddie be with the sea and so that kind of concludes the very infancy of Hokulea. You gotta remember now, we, we had a we, we had this physical confrontation in 1976. Now in 1978, we we basically flipped the canoe over and we kill one of our crew members, Eddie Aikau. And so the Polynesian Voyaging Society is at its lowest point, right? People are saying that we should just take the canoe, put it in a museum. We already proved that we could sail to Tahiti without instruments. But there, it came down to a group of native Hawaiians, right, who got together after the, uh, after the swampy, who talked about what Eddie, Eddie had wanted to see. Eddie had this strong desire to see Tahiti rise out of the sea from the bow of the canoe. And, and quite frankly, it was Hawaiians who just could not let uh, part of Eddie's dream uh, go to waste. And so we decided that we'd rebuild the canoe, took us from 1978 to 1979 to reconstruct the canoe, to recommit to training, and then to add a secure secondary vessel to the fleet called the second canoe. It was our established uh, escort boat. And then attempt again to sail Hokulea back to Tahiti in 1980. Next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, next slide. Okay, so in 1979, right, um, we had rebuilt the canoe, we had established good training policy. Uh, we had our navigator, Nainoa Thompson, uh, but Nainoa Thompson was having some severe issues with what he was about to attempt. He was having trouble uh, dealing with the fact that a navigator needs to spend many sleepless nights on the canoe. And, and, and he was just being troubled spiritually about the challenge ahead. And after talking with his dad, the dad kind of uh, figured out what was wrong. And he proposed to Nainoa, he says, what, what you need to do is, you need to you need your, your traditional teacher to come and round out your training, Mao Pi Island. So Nainoa hears that Mao is gonna be on the island of Saipan. And so Nainoa flies to Saipan and there on the beach he meets Mao Pi Island. So Mao is very apologetic for the for his departure in nineteen seventy six from the crew. And Nainoa is apologetic for the behavior of the crew. And so they both get together and they forgive what's hap what happened in the past and i know invites mao to hawaii to round out his training and and mao is uncommittal he says that uh, uh go go back to hawaii and you'll get your answer from me in a, in a few months and in a few months he gets a call from the uh, a customs agent at honolulu international airport and he says uh there's this gentleman mao pi log here at the airport and you have to come down and pick him up and so since that december 1979 uh, well, Mao and Nainoa have uh, worked well together. And uh, Mao basically says that he's coming back to Hawaii to teach Nainoa how to navigate so that no more Hawaiians will, 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 die, will die, die while sailing canoes. And so they end up working and laying out the system side by side. And what happens is in comparison, uh, from Nainoa's academically based system with Mao's traditional system, it's 
it's exactly identical. They 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 are the, the same system, except now I know has the ability to explain the math and science connections that Mao's got already established in his in his wayfinding system. Okay, next. And so since ni 1980, we have sailed the canoe successfully, hopefully all across the world. Okay, next. Okay, so Mao system is a system called wayfinding, right? Which encompasses all the ways in which people and animals orient themselves in physical space and navigate from place to place. And it's often used to refer to traditional navigation methods used by indigenous people. Nainoa system is non-instrument navigation, right? It is based upon ma academics, math, science, right? It is basically navigation with, without the use of instruments, okay? Next slide. There are three things you need in a wayfinding system. One thing you need is a device to help orientate the canoe, like a compass, right? The second thing is you need to locate your canoe on an ocean passage, right? You need to know how many miles you've sailed in a direction and how many miles is left on the journey. And lastly, you need to expand landfall or, or uh, create a larger target so that you can make safe arrival on an island. And that has to do with looking at the flight paths of birds and looking at things like that float in the water as you're approaching islands. Uh, okay, so those are the three things you need to do. Next. Yeah. So the device that we use to help orientate the canoe is what's called a star compass, right? So 32 stones make up the perimeter of the circle. The circle is the is the horizon, right? Any place that the sun, uh, any place that the sky touches touches the horizon, right? The horizon being uh, either the ocean edge or the land around you, yeah, creates the circle of the horizon, which is represented by those thirty-two stones. So thirty-two stones, right? Each one of those stones we call a house. A house represents a place where a star lives. So you have 15 stones on one horizon, half the circle, 15 stones on the opposite horizon, the other half of the circle, and the last two stones make the pivot points that the sky turns on. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here's our circle, right? We define the edges of the circle, right? The side of the circle where everything arrives, the sun, the moon, the planets, uh, and the stars is called hikina. The word hiki means to arrive, right? And that, that's basically the direction east, okay? Opposite that, yeah, is the direction we call komohana. The word komo means to enter. So you have the arriving and you have the entering, okay? East and west. So if I stand with my back facing east, I look west. If I extend my right hand out, the right hand on my body is called akao, right? Also means north. If I extend my left hand out, it's called hema, means south. Yeah, which divides the circle into four quadrants, right? Four quadrants. One, two, three, four. Right. The quadrants are named for the winds that, that blow out of these quadrants: Kolao, Malanai, Kona, and Ho'olua. Right. And then, and then you have seven houses between east and north, and seven houses between east and south seven houses between west and north and seven houses between uh west and south okay the houses have the same names so next slide so this is the way stars move across from horizon to horizon this is the way any celestial body moves if it arrives here in this house which we name aina it's going to enter the circle of the horizon it's going to climb 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 up into the sky until it gets above your head, right? That imaginary line that runs between the North Celestial Pole and the South Celestial Pole, Akao and Hema, right? It's called the meridian. Once it crosses the meridian, it starts to descend and it's gonna exit the compass in the same house in a Rosen, in the same hemisphere, only thing on the opposite horizon. So here, if it arises here in the house we call Aina, it's gonna set in the house we call Aina on the opposite horizon, right? If it rises here in a house we call Naleo, 
it's going to move across the compass and it's going to set it the level. stars or all celestial bodies are hemispherical if it arrives in the north it sits in the north but here right the wind and the waves right they move from quadrant to quadrant but it's the same concept they move from the house of the same name to the house of the same name so if the wind was he was blowing here from the house we call manukola or if the the wave was to move from the house we call manukola it's going to roll in here or blow through the center of the compass and it's going to exit the same house in the opposite quadrant right and so whereas a magnetic compass focuses on magnetic north one point we're able to focus in on anything along the visual horizon okay next okay the reason why our compass uh, works well is because we live in this area that's called the tropics the tropic of cancer here in the north tropic of capricorn here in the south is basically 23 and a half degrees north 23 and a half degrees south it's equatorial the stars rise vertically within these these regions yeah like if this this compass wouldn't be effective if you're if you're up here on the uh, in the north pole because things wouldn't rise vertically they just move along the horizon so our compass is specific to uh to the locality we uh, we use it in okay next slide Next slide. I think we're frozen. Yeah, I think uh, Mr. Bonkowitz's camera froze up. I can see if I can um, present the same slideshow here. Unless Mr. Bonowitz is able to join back in. It looks like he jumped out and might be rebooting. We joined. He'll be back soon. Yeah. You guys have any questions? Can you talk more about um, expanding landfall? And some of the things that okay you look for. okay we'll, yeah we'll we'll get to the expanding landfall uh, uh, in in about half a dozen slides but expanding landfall is basically right the 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 star field will tell you uh, when you're getting close to land right so when you're getting close to land you start looking for uh, clues that'll lead you towards the island and the best clue for that is. Uh, is uh okay the best clue for that is are, are birds birds are the best clue for the land okay so uh so i'm gonna do a little uh, short lesson here on the night sky and what we uh we learn the night sky by this uh by this chant that we do which with st students it's called e ohi ohi in pono it means Voyager, gather up your possession. So I'll call out e ohi ohi inapono, and the, uh, and the students reply, he ka, he ivi, he makau, he lupi, a baler, a bone, a fishuk, a kite. Okay? And we all say together, u lako ka ipu akaho, the God of the navigator is provision. So the baler, the bone, the fishuk, and the kite are basically what we call a star line. Yeah? Whereas, there are basically 88 constellations in the night sky. We've simplified it down to four star lines. So you, if you go out in the night sky, you will always see at least two of these star lines up at any time of the night. And they're basically uh, a series of constellations that run between uh, the North Celestial Pole and the South Celestial Pole. Remember again that, that we are we live in a tropic so we can see most of the night sky so next slide so a baler a bone a fish and a kite next slide okay so here's a baler right this right now is up early in the morning in, in december okay that's the baler next slide 
And the baler is made up of, uh, next slide. The baler is made up of these bright stars here. It's, this is Capella. Okay, go back one. This is Capella. This is Gemini, Castor and Pollock, Donna Moon, Donna Hopi. This is Procyon, Little Dog. And right here is Sirius, yeah, the brightest, brightest star in the night sky. So this makes a bowl, and the handle of the bowl is the second brightest star in the night sky, Canopus. And so it's basically rising here in the east. And the way you find this is you got to look for a, a pretty uh, obvious uh, star constellation. And what you look for in this star line is these three stars here, which is Orion's Belt. Yeah. So if you draw a line through Orion's Belt, one line will take you to Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. If you draw a line in the opposite direction, it takes you to Makali or the Pleiades. Okay, next star line. So the next star line is, is the, uh, the Eevee, the bowl. Right, and it's basically the backbone. It is made up of the Big Dipper. Okay, it's made up of the Big Dipper. Two stars here that point from the bucket of Big Dipper points to its Polaris. You follow the, the handle of the Big Dipper down to here. This star that passes right over Hawaii called Hokulea, and then to Spica, and then to this little box here you call you call Corvus, which you draw a line through the middle and it points towards the Southern Cross. You will see the Southern Cross in this position here on December 7th, just, just before sunrise. Next slide. And then the, uh, the third star line is called the Fishuk, and it is made up of Scorpio. Again, we're looking for obvious constellations that we can, we can draw a picture of. Okay. This is the Northern Summer Triangle. Okay. Next slide. The Northern Triangle is made up of uh, three stars, Altair, Humu, Keoi, Vega, and uh, uh, Deneb in Cygnus as well. And this represents a coil of rope or fishing line that circles around here to Maui's fish hook or Scorpio. And it's fishing after, uh, it's fishing after uh, Pimoy, which is the magical, uh, uh, Celestial Jack that uh, uh, is made up of uh, Sagittarius. Okay, next slide. And Sagittarius, what's interesting, next slide, what's interesting about Sagittarius, and this is Sagittarius right here, right? This is, go back one. And this is Sagittarius right here. This is Maui's fish hook. Yeah. This is Sagittarius right here. And the center of our Milky Way galaxy is right here off the, off the barb of, of Maui's fish hook and in the heart of, of, of Sagittarius. This is the center of our Milky Way galaxy, right? Next slide. And the last, the last star line is, so we, we taught, I taught you the, the, uh, the baler, the bone, the fish hook, and then the kite. The kite is made up of these four stars here called uh, uh, the Great Square of Pegasus. Next slide. And that great square of Pegasus in the evening tonight, it's it's right above your head, right? And it's made up of these four stars here, which are named after chiefs. Chiefs called Kiawe, the chief of uh, chief of Hawaii Island, Pilani, the chief of Maui, Manokalani, Po, and Kakuyeva. Okay, next slide. So that's how we read the night sky. It's through the four star line. But our navigation is totally visual, right? The, the navigator gets up in the morning, he looks at the, the rising sun or the setting sun, he watches it come out of the ocean, and then he lines up the waves and the wind, the direction the wind is blowing from, and he feels the motion of the canoe as it sails across uh, the water. Next slide. But we, as navigators are totally visual right we take everything in through our eyes okay next slide okay so that's uh that's the, the compass and, and the star field section okay the next is to be able to uh to dead reckon we do dead reckoning basically to a mathematical formula right it's speed and we 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 count speed by by 
being able to look at the ocean and watch the waves as it rolls past the front of the canoe and the back back of the canoe. So speed multiplied by time, right? It's an algebraic form formula equals this. It's so we have one uh we have our cross pieces that hold the two canoes together we that's a measured distance right it's about 40 feet um uh, we basically count how many seconds it takes for the wave to move from the front of the canoe to the back of the canoe we have an algebraic formula that we use to compute the speed so let's say we watch the wave and it takes five seconds for it to move from the front of the canoe to the back of the canoe that equates to about five knots or five miles an hour if we multiply five knots between sunrise and sunset or 12 hours, then we've gone 60 nautical miles. And so we dead reckon it throughout the day by estimating speed and then calculating distance at the end of a 12 hour period so that we can calculate how far along the trip we've gone and how, how many more days we have till we arrive at land. Okay, next slide. And so basically, it's a wave that breaks here at the front of the canoe, and then it rolls all the way to the back of the canoe. That's a measured distance, and we're able to establish a rate. And that rate allows us guys to compute how fast we're traveling. Again, and then travel is estimated on 12-hour increments because we don't use any wristwatches when we're out there. The definite times of the day we know is sunrise and sunset. Next slide. Okay, so these are like, it, it, it's 2,400 miles. And if you're going 120 miles a day, it's, 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 it's like 20 days to get here to Tahiti. So all you're doing is calculating how far along the course you've gone so that you know how far you've traveled and how far you have remaining in your, in your trip. So you can figure out exactly when you're going to arrive at land. And, and what tells you, when you're getting close to to landfall are the altitudes of stars right if you if you leave here in hawaii and the north star is 20 20 degrees above the horizon right when you get to the equator you lose the height of the north star right so the sky is changing and so the northern sky gets lower and it gets lower until the sky looks uh for the right height for these these latitudes and all that does is next slide is tell you when you should be able to expect to see land landfall. Right. Again, we're measuring the altitudes of stars by using our, our our hands extended. Next slide. And our hands are measured precisely. Uh, we calibrate our hands in uh, amounts of degrees from the horizon here where, where this thumb is to the top of our, our middle finger. Next slide. And we can measure the altitudes of stars as it passes through meridian very, very accurately. Next slide. All right. And we use our, our hands all the time to help us guys uh, measure the spatial relationship between objects in the sky and, and uh, space along the horizon. Next slide. Like for the latitude of Hawaii, when you leave Tahiti, this Southern Cross, this is Southern Cross upright is like 40 something degrees above the horizon. But when you, every day you sail to Hawaii, this Southern Cross will get closer and closer to the horizon. Next slide. And when it gets to a height where the top star and the bottom star is equal to the horizon, you're basically at the, at the latitude of, uh, of Keao. And so, you sail north until you get this, this configuration in the night sky, top star, bottom star, equal to the horizon, and then you're at the latitude of Keao. Yeah? And if you employ a technique called upwind sailing, which is to be upwind of the islands, right? The, uh, the wind blows from east to west. When you cross this line, you simply turn your canoe and let the wind blow you down, downwind, and you should be able to sail right into the islands. Next slide. There are archaeoastronomical uh, uh, sites within the islands. This is uh, this is called a sighting wall. It's the only one of its kind. This is on South Maui. Yeah. 
this knot in the wall helps to identify the meridian. Next slide. And so the Southern Cross will rise here, circle, and this is what you see right here, is the Southern Cross above the notch in the wall, right? So this is evidence that Hawaiians were more than just, uh, they were very careful observers of the environment, and they were able to create things within, uh, create uh, uh, archaeological sites within their physical environment to help them learn about the night sky. Next slide. And all this does is, is, again, allows you to range in the islands because as you're getting close to islands, next slide, you're going to look for things that help identify the islands to the observer. And basically, what you're looking for are birds. These white turns, you'll see them 72 hours before you arrive on the island. And then they have a, a, a sister in the species. It's black or brown. When you see those black or brown turns, you're definitely within 24 hours of, of land. So the night sky tells you when you're getting close to land. The birds will lead you into land. And then things like seaweed, right? Seaweed floating offshore will tell you that you're in the range of islands. And then when you get, when, get downwind of these islands, the sea goes calm. It goes flat. And then you can estimate that you're probably only a few hours from finding an island. Okay, next slide. All right. Uh, and so again, right, you measure the height of the top star and the bottom star and the southern cross, and then you turn your canoe downwind and let the wind blow you all the way downwind. Okay, next slide. How are we doing on time, John? Uh, five minutes. And you did have uh, one question okay. a while ago uh, from Owen. He said, can you explain more about the compass? Okay. I don't know, maybe you answered his questions, but yeah, he was interested more in the compass. Yeah, again, the, the, the compass is just a, it's, it's a conceptual device, right? You teach the lessons around the device, and then um, uh, you take the lessons with you on the canoe. You don't take the compass with you on a canoe. You, you commit that to memory, right? And so the compass just becomes a framework uh, for thinking through, uh, uh, thinking through the navigational process uh, for establishing direction and orientation. I'm just going to take you through a quick voyage. This is the last big complex voyage that we did. Next slide. And this is a voyage to, uh, uh, to Easter Island. Easter Island was a challenge, right? It's super small. Uh, we didn't know how to navigate there, so it took us guys almost. Uh, it took us guys almost twenty five years to figure out how we're going to navigate to the island of uh, Rapa Nui. Next slide. And Rapa Nui is pretty small. It's it's seven miles by about twenty miles wide. Yeah, seven miles wide by twenty miles long. Uh, uh, they killed off all the seabirds there because they introduced the hawk, and, and so. Uh, we didn't have, we weren't going to have very, very good crews. Next slide. And the winds, the winds, oh, next slide. And the winds blow from east to west. And so we're sailing uh, from east to west. Uh, we're, so we're going to tack all the way up when we change the sails on our canoe for this, uh, uh, for this leg, only because these, uh, the ancient sails weren't weren't windward savvy like these modern Marconi rig sails. Uh, but we're going to navigate to uh, Rapa Nui. The use of a uh, uh, non-instrument navigation. Next, next slide. Yeah, we predict that it's going to take us guys forty days of tacking up wind to get to uh, Rapa Nui. But we're also smart Hawaiians in that we study science. And what science tells us is that if you leave in October, November, there's a chance that the winds are going to switch around. Instead of blowing from the east, they're going to come from the north. And if you pick up, the, if you sail in the right period, it's going to basically blow you 
all the way across to Rapa Nui, just on those northerly winds. So we waited, and we got on a north wind, and it took us, instead of taking us guys 40 days to get to Rapa Nui, it took us only 20 days to get there. We got there two weeks before our rival party was supposed to show up. Uh, okay, so next slide. But it was a completely serious, serious sail, right? So what Rapa Nui is known for is the stone moai. Next. Stone moai are stone statues. Uh, we begin our, our, our sail uh, by sailing from Hawaii to this uh, idyllic uh, uh, islands called the Marquesas. And then from the Marquesas, hello, next slide, we sail south to Mangareva at the very tip of the Tuamoto Archipelago. And then from Mangareva, we begin our 1600 mile uh, straight upwind journey to, uh, uh, to Rapa Nui. Next slide. The last island we, we come to in the Tuamotu archipelago chain is this, this little rocky uh, outcrop here. Uh, next slide. Which you know uh, through its history as the island of Pitcairn. Pitcairn was uh, settled by, uh, uh, by Polynesians first, but later on it was settled by uh, 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 Christian Fletcher, Fletcher Christian, right? Uh, the uh, the uh, famous uh, 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 mutineer on the uh, on the uh, ship, the the Bounty. There's only about 43 people on the island. They all take their last name uh, uh, back to the uh, uh, to to Fletcher Christian, the, the original settler. Next slide. But from there to uh, uh, to Rapa Nui, it's supposed to take us. 40 days again next slide it is it is super challenging for us uh very very serious very very mature crew only because we're looking for a, a small target uh in a big big ocean next slide but after about 20 days on the morning of the 20th day uh we are hunting down islands not expecting the island for another 48 hours uh but sure enough next slide on the bow of the canoe, we see the island of Rapa Nui. Next slide. Um, and so I always like to be the first person to greet the, the native islanders on board. Next slide. So what Rapa Nui is known for, again, are these stone statues. All these stone statues come from one large quarry on the island. Next slide. Um, right. And Yet they went through a series of upheavals on the island where they knocked over all the stone statues. The stone statues have only been re-erected since uh, the uh, 1970s. Next slide. So once they once they knocked the stone statues over, next slide, it was replaced with the Orongo cult. The Orongo cult is what's called the Birdman cult. They lived uh, every year. Contestants from each tribe would be taken to this uh, uh, to this houses in uh, on, the, on the northeast side of the island right and they would live there until what what would happen was the orongo would, would occur orongo means bird call next slide and so when they hear these birds calling right these birds are migrating to this island uh, and they're gonna nest and they're gonna lay eggs the competition would begin where the orongo birdmen uh competitors would scale down this cliff swim across to this island and they would wait for the first egg to be laid and then they would they would capture that egg and they would have to swim back to this island scale up this cliff without breaking the egg and then present the egg to the to the island chief and then that person's tribe would control all the resources for the for the next year next slide okay are we uh are we at the end of class yet john we are yeah we are oh. It's it's a couple minutes after. I didn't want to stop you though. <laughs> okay. But it's really. All right, we can end it. But yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, yeah, guys, uh, help me help me thank Kalepa for for coming and uh, and talking uh, with you. That was uh, was absolutely amazing.